episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really fascinating guest today, helping to create a better tomorrow uh, on many different fronts. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Jennifer Garrison, uh, who is Assistant Professor at the Buck Institute for Research on Aging, uh, founder and faculty director of the Global Consortium for Reproductive Longevity and Equality, Assistant Professor in Residence in Cellular and Molecular Pharmacology at UCSF, and Adjunct Assistant Professor of Gerontology at USC Leonard Davis School of Gerontology. I need to say she does a lot of things. Uh, Dr. Garrison's lab is uh, very interested in understanding how neuropeptides, which is this fascinating class of uh, signaling molecules that are secreted uh, from neurons and transmit all sorts of messages within the brain and across the nervous system, ultimately regulate changes in normal and aging animals, uh, ultimately as well as understanding how they control behavior at both the cell, biological, and neural circuit levels. Uh, Dr. Garrison and received her PhD from the University of California, San Francisco uh, in chemistry and chemical biology and laboratory Dr. Jack Taunton, where she uh, was working on molecular targets of natural products and elucidated uh, novel mechanisms or small molecules uh, to regulate protein biogenesis. Uh, she did postdoc work in Dr. Corey Bargman's lab at Rockefeller University, uh, working uh, on the, uh, the evolutionary precursor of uh, mammalian peptides, vasopressin and oxytocin. Uh, Dr. Garrison, was named uh, Alfred Cleason Research Fellow and received Glenn Foundation Award for Research in Biological Mechanisms of Aging in 2014, uh, Next Generation Leader of the Allen Institute for Brain Science in 2015, and her work is funded by numerous sources, including the uh, NIH, National Institutes of General Medical Sciences, the Glenn Foundation for Medical Research, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and the Larry L. Hilblum uh, Foundation. Uh, wow, a lot to talk about today. Dr. Jennifer Garrison, thanks so much for taking time out of your schedule. Oh, thank you, Ira, for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you. Yeah, we have a lot of exciting things to talk about. Um, I'd love to start off just uh, like we typically do by handing you the floor for a couple minutes. If you could talk uh, just a little bit more about uh, your background, where you grew up, uh, how you got interested in science in general, and sort of when aging uh, became a really important uh, target and interest of yours. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, I was born on the East Coast, right outside of Washington, D.C., and, and I spent my first 14 years there. I moved to the Bay Area, California, uh, when I was in high school, and so I went to high school in the Silicon Valley. Um, then I went to UC Berkeley for my undergrad in um, molecular uh, cell biology, and um, I was drawn to science actually from some very early experiences, um, growing up right around in D.C., uh, in the 80s, um, I saw and knew uh, several people, um, many of the, the male role models in my life essentially uh, were afflicted by the AIDS pandemic and, mm. uh, and some of them died. And I was very young and impressionable around that time. And so I got into science because I wanted to cure AIDS. That was my goal, mm. <laughs> just a tiny little goal. Uh, and so that was where I started. Uh, when I went to UC Berkeley, I had the opportunity to work in a, a variety of different uh, types of labs. So my first research experience was actually at uh, NASA Ames um, at the Moffitt Research Center. Mm -hmm. And um, I, <laughs> I worked on a project called Sensors 2000, which tells you how long ago that was. And the goal was to develop uh, miniature implantable sensors for different um, uh, physiologic processes that would allow um, allow animals to be monitored in space without having wires hanging off of them. Mm. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a strange project, but as part of that, um, we collaborated with the UCSF Fetal Treatment Center, and they were doing this really cool work um, to uh, correct a congenital defect, which essentially was a, a hole in uh, the diaphragm. And it's such a small defect, but um, you know the lungs are the last thing to develop in a fetus, and so okay. um, with the hole in the diaphragm, you know all of the intestinal organs were um, everything in the body cavity basically um, didn't make space for the, the lungs to develop, and so those babies were born, you know, severely um, handicapped or or weren't born at all. And so um, essentially, they were using at the time was very cool uh, laparoscopic techniques to go in and sew up that hole, um, doing surgery on the fetus. And um, it turned out that uh, 
after surgery, you know, they had to monitor mothers for preterm labor. And the best indicator of preterm labor was a change in the pH in the vaginal canal. Mm. And I was working on the implantable pH sensor. And so I got to go as a very young, I think I was probably like 19, um, go and watch these surgeries, which was super cool. Um, that kind of opened up my mind to other areas of science. Um, and I worked in a lab uh, doing X-ray protein crystallography. So looking at structure um, at a very molecular level. Um, I worked in a lab uh, that was an immunology lab focused around single chain FEs. So these mm-hmm. antibody fragments um, and phage display technology to um, select for different antibody fragments. And anyway, I was all over the map um, and uh, got a really a, you know, a taste for different areas of science. And so when I did my PhD, um, I was really fascinated by chemistry. Uh, now, uh, um, I understand that you were also <laughs> have a background in chemistry. I thought, uh, maybe naively, I thought that as a biologist, if I could understand how to make molecules, um, that I would basically be invincible, that, that having those two pieces of, of knowledge would, would really um, allow me to explore space that maybe other scientists couldn't. And so I joined the UCSF PhD program in chemistry and chemical biology, which essentially, um, you know, was designed to train students in chemistry, but with an eye towards understanding how to use chemicals or, or small molecules as tools sure. um, to, you know, to dissect biology. Um, and that was really an amazing experience being at UCSF. Um, and while I was there, I, I did this really exciting project focused around a fungal natural product. <laughs> uh, so I got to do, you know, some really innovative synthetic organic chemistry on one side, and then some really cool cell biology to try to figure out what the target, what the cellular target of this, this natural product was. Um, and that led me towards bioactive peptides. Um, mm-hmm. So this fungal natural product is itself um, a bioactive peptide. It's a cyclic Dexy peptide with a lot of non-natural amino acid side chains. That's where the cool chemistry came in. Yeah. Um, but it turns out to target a pathway in the cell, um, essentially the pathway that all secreted and membrane proteins have to go through. Um, so the secretory pathway. And this, this small molecule targeted a channel in the in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum, which is basically where every protein that's going to be secreted or go to the surface of the cell has to to go through this channel. Mm -hmm. Um, And, but it didn't block all secreted and transmembrane proteins from going through the channel, just a subset of them. Um, And and I won't go into too much detail here, but it turned out to to hinge on an N-terminal piece of the the protein called the Mm -hmm. signal sequence, which is also a, a, a sort of a, a form of a bioactive peptide. Um, and so that got me really excited about, about peptides in general. And um, when I was looking for postdocs, I wanted to change fields. I wanted to do something completely different. I wanted to learn something completely new. And so um, I turned to neuroscience because I felt like the brain is maybe the, the last unexplored, um, like real black box in biology. Um, If you think about it, the human brain is probably one of the most complex objects in the universe. Uh, Obviously, I'm biased, but but that's something that I think is true. And so um, I moved to the Rockefeller University with Corey Bargman to study neural circuits and behavior. Um, And again, I was drawn towards bioactive peptides, this class of peptides called neuropeptides, um, partly because they had been really ignored. Um, They were sort of, when I started almost considered like a backwater of neuroscience. They were, mm-hmm. they were mostly not thought of as being important. They were thought of as being just kind of like accessory molecules that were really just there to help the classical neurotransmitters. So the small molecules that we all know about like GABA and glutamate and serotonin and dopamine. Right. Neuropeptides were thought to just kind of be there to help them along. Um, and it turns out that they're really important signaling molecules in their own right. So, um, when I was looking for faculty positions, um, you know, I, I thought a lot about what, what sort of, what are the biggest questions in biology that we don't have an answer to yet? Um, and aging was something that, you know, that I think uh, in that moment, which was, you know, six, seven years ago now, um, aging was just coming into its own 
uh, you know, and the idea that you can target a whole host of diseases simultaneously by understanding basic mechanisms of aging biology mm -hmm. was really uh, attractive to me. And the part of the brain that I care about and that I think a lot about is the part of the brain that controls a lot of homeostatic systems. So things like um, energy homeostasis, fluid homeostasis, circadian rhythms, reproductive biology, body temperature regulation. This part of the brain um, is incredibly neurochemically diverse. It's mm -hmm. the place where most, you know, it, it uses neuropeptides to signal. And um, it's those homeostatic systems that get uh, disrupted during aging, right? All of the, the, the major yeah. hallmarks of aging that we observe in humans, things like changes in energy, homeostasis, and, um, and circadian rhythms, and all of those things are broadly governed by the hypothalamus. So, you know, my hypothesis is that, you know, this homeostatic balance that's set up between the brain and the rest of your organs, that disruptions in that the communication between the brain and the rest of the body is maybe the first domino to fall when we're mm -hmm. talking about aging, you know, and um, there's a lot of downstream uh, consequences of aging that we know very well, but, but I'm interested in what's that causal thing. What is that thing, that very first thing that happens, which leads to the downstream effects that we, we see in aging. Um, and so I think about that as, as being governed by the hypothalamus and as neuropeptides are the, the molecules that, that mediate communication there, um, it was kind of an obvious thing for me to, to move into the aging field. Mm -hmm. And I was very fortunate to find a faculty position at the Buck Institute. Really, really fascinating uh, journey into this space. And, you know, as, you, as you're talking about it and thinking, um, you know, we have this uh, class of, of these messengers, these neuropeptides, we think by the name of oh, neuro, okay, it's mainly to do with the central nervous system, but no, uh, these materials are released, they affect the gut, our muscles, our heart, um, they diffuse all over the place. Um, you know, I, I just um, I spent a little time sort of the regenerative biology world, and, and you know, there's a whole interesting area of uh, I think the term is neuralization about how some of these peptides are also uh, very good at you know uh, if they're not around when regeneration happens, regeneration doesn't happen too well, and that's just another interesting area of how sort of we overlook the importance of of sort of these these other systems that we don't really think of as primary, but yes, they are extremely important. Um, talk a little bit about. Um, you mentioned the neuropeptide now connection to aging, and you're looking for sort of that first thing, uh, maybe the second and the third things also. Um, what are some of those things? And talk a little bit about some of the time that you spend working on neuropeptides and aging. What exactly are you looking at in, in this particular area of your research? Yeah, um, well, so one thing to understand about neuropeptides is, as you just pointed out, neuropeptide is really a misnomer because um, they definitely are made by neurons. Um, and sensed by neurons, yep. but they're also made by non-neuronal tissue. <laughs> yep. uh, so it, it's a little bit confusing. They sure. can be made all over the body and um, it's a signaling system, right? And, and so they're not active until they're released by a cell. And so there's really multiple components that you have to consider. So one is the cell that makes and releases the peptide itself. The other is the cell that expresses, um, that senses the peptide. So the target cell, and that could be a neuron or it could be some other kind of tissue. And the target cell has a receptor or, you know, you can think of it kind of like a catcher's mitt um, for the peptide. And so there's those two components. And then there's a third component, which is uh, peptidases, which are these enzymes that are potentially um, in the extracellular space or on the outside of a cell facing out that can mm -hmm. degrade neuropeptides. And so that's a point of regulation in the system. So there's these three components that you have to think about, but they're signaling over uh, relatively long time scales. So when you think about, um, you know, when I say neuropeptide signaling, most people who are not neuroscientists, they immediately picture a synapse, right? right. This picture of, <laughs> of, of two cells that are physically connected yep. and they're picturing the vesicle release there and, and the, you know, the whole thing. And, and that's not what we're talking about for the most part. That kind of signaling is classical neurotransmission. It's really fast. So it happens on the millisecond time scale. Um, it's turned off really quickly, either by recycling those transmitters into the presynaptic neuron or by degrading um, the transmitters in the synaptic cleft. And, um, you know, those are, that's just completely different from what we're talking about. So neuropeptide signaling happens on a much longer time scale relative to the brain. So um, seconds to minutes, even to hours. Mm -hmm. 
And neuropeptides can then potentially signal over long distances. So in principle, a neuropeptide can signal to any cell that has the appropriate receptor. And so, um, you know, they have longer half-lives in the brain in particular. And, you know, correlating release of a peptide in one place with signaling over a long time scale in a different place is really difficult, right? Experimentally, that's a tricky system to try to try to attack. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that our knowledge of how peptidergic signaling works is trailing behind synaptic signaling by decades, maybe 30 years, right? We've only just recently in the last few years really developed tools that are appropriate and and able to interrogate this kind of signaling in a way that gives us the same kind of resolution that we have for synaptic signaling. So it's a really exciting time. There's a lot of unanswered questions. And I think, um, you know, if a neuron, if a cell is peptidergic, if it makes peptides to release, then um, it's not making just one. So um, it's going to make maybe dozens. And I think historically, uh, you know, and the field of endocrinology, which is maybe where researchers who focused on this problem before were housed, um, endocrinology tended to focus on one peptide at a time, right? So if I was studying oxytocin, that would be the thing I studied kind of in isolation. But really what we're finding is that it's maybe the cocktail of peptides that a cell or a group of cells releases that's more important than Mm -hmm. an individual peptide. And so it suddenly becomes this combinatorial nightmare because if a cell can release dozens of peptides and those peptides can bind to multiple receptors, individual receptors can bind to multiple peptides, it becomes very quickly extraordinarily complex. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, it's only in the very recent uh, years that we've been able to come up with ways to, to look at these problems. I'm not sure I answered your question there. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it, it's per- perfect, but spot on, spot on. And, um, you know, I, I, you, you mentioned um, uh, there in, in, in what you were just talking about, you, you brought up oxytocin and, um, you know, here we have um, a hormone slash neurotransmitter. Uh, we, we, we learn about it in biology. It's an, an importance in, in childbirth and breastfeeding and, and controlling bleeding after childbirth um, also has all these interesting connections with uh, empathy and, and sexual activity. And, and it's known as the love hormone. Uh, talk a little bit about the potential of oxytocin as a rejuvenation hormone and how uh, you got it. And this was a little earlier on in your work, but uh, sort of the connections there and how this sort of feeds back into the whole area of, uh, of these neurohormones and neuropeptides. Yeah, absolutely. Oxytocin is a, a beautiful example of a neuropeptide. In fact, it, um, it really has a lot of the hallmarks that, that uh, I think most people don't appreciate. And so thank you for asking about it. <laughs> uh, so oxytocin is, uh, you know, it's considered like one-stop shopping sort of for maternal function, right? It's important for, um, for partuition for childbirth. So oxytocin binding to receptors on the uterine muscle wall actually induce contractions during labor. Um, it's required for milk let down during lactation. So it gets an animal born, it gets an animal fed. And then it's also required for mother infant bonding. So that emotional, as you just uh, described. And so it also gets the animals taken care of. And that's most of what people know about it. Um, and, you know, more recently, there's been those papers showing that it might be important for trust um, and social bonding between humans. Mm-hmm. Um but it also does a lot of other things. So and, and like most neuropeptides, it actually has um, one set of things that it does during development that's completely separate from and distinct from what it does during adulthood. So what I just described are sort of functions that it has in adulthood. During development, it's important for fetal heart development, <laughs> um, but it doesn't have anything to do with heart function later in life. Right. And that's true for a lot of neuropeptides. They, they will have one role during development and another during adulthood. And we think that they may then have even a, a third more distinct role during aging. And you know, oxytocin and vasopressin, which you may have also heard of, sure. they are um, often spoken about in the same breath. And that's because even though they do very different things, oxytocin and vasopressin um, are almost identical. So they arose from a gene duplication event and um, they're nine amino acids. So they're nine MERS and they only differ at two positions. They're identical. um, Seven of the positions are the same and two are different. And um, also like most neuropeptidergic systems, um, what that means is that they can substitute for each other. 
So oxytocin can bind to vasopressin receptors, vasopressin can bind to oxytocin receptors. And this is a common feature of pathogenic signaling. There's a lot of redundancy built into mm -hmm. these signaling systems so that if you knock one out, the other can compensate. And so for that reason, um, genetic knockouts, so where you just knock out a gene and look at what happens to the animal, yep. they tend not to work very well for neuropeptides <laughs> because there's a lot of this developmental compensation. And so I think that's also kind of hampered work in the field. Um, but when, with respect to oxytocin, um, you know, what we're trying to do in my lab is to understand how, how neuropeptides signal just in general mm -hmm. and normal uh, during normal aging, um, how they change with age, basically how this chemical conversation between the brain and the rest of the body changes with age. Mm -hmm. And so we started with oxytocin um, because during my postdoc, I had uh, spent quite a bit of time um, characterizing uh, a, a, a related homolog called nematocin, which is uh, sure. important. Yeah, it's, it's basically the worm version of oxytocin or vasopressin. Yep. And I had found a role for this um, for this peptide in male mating behavior. And so that was really striking to me. We had expected to find something a little bit more, I don't know, basic, a little <laughs> bit more ancient, a little bit something more like fluid homeostasis or, mm -hmm. you know, um, something to do with energy homeostasis. But we actually found that the behavioral function of this peptide was conserved all the way back between humans and worms, which was pretty eye-opening. Um, and that's another feature of neuropeptides is that they tend to control not just the physiology. So, um, you know, for energy homeostasis, for example, um, they'll also control the behaviors. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, for energy homeostasis, we think about things like, um, like, uh, you know, uh, ATP balance and, and things like that, but they also would then control feeding behavior. Okay. And that's true with oxytocin and vasopressin as well. Um, and so when I started my lab at the Buck Institute, we actually, you know, we were looking at other neuropeptides and, and their role in aging. And I threw in some mutants for oxytocin um, as a control. I thought, gosh, if we knock out oxytocin, because there's only one peptide in worms, so there's no chance for any compensation there. Um, I thought oh, these worms are definitely going to be short-lived, right? So it'll be a great control. Uh, and they turned out to be long-lived. And this led to a whole project in the lab looking at the function of oxytocin um, and related peptides in aging. And what we found is that it's, it's a, has, plays a really complex role in mediating different aging phenotypes. And um, it does seem to translate to mammals. And that led us actually into reproductive aging because when we went in tried to tease apart, you know, what's the mechanism? How is it actually functioning? How is it actually affecting these uh, longevity and stress resistance phenotypes? Um, we, we came across it basically it's functioning at the level of the reproductive system. Really, really fascinating. And, um, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned a couple of things uh, in there. You mentioned um, the terms uh, chemical conversations. And then prior to that, we're talking about neuropeptides. We're talking about sort of the, the combinatorial uh, nightmare, but <laughs> the combinatorial nature of, of these materials. Um, and now bringing that together, uh, we move on to sort of your thought leadership in the area of the role of the brain in female reproductive aging. And here you clearly have uh, unique chemical conversations going on. You have your brain, uh, the, the nervous system, and then we have the ovary, which is its own little um, microenvironment of, of things <laughs> happening. And then sort of oocytes themselves, they're the unique, we'll put that aside for now. Um, so we, we have this period of life where, you know, at the end of reproduction uh, and the fertility in, in, in women, this cascade of really negative stuff happens in bone and cognition, cardiovascular system. Uh, talk about how you're, you're, you're merging all this together in, in terms of everything we've just been discussing into this really important area that's, uh, I think, really going to be a, a major area of the longevity space moving forward in the coming years. I mean, I think so, but I'm obviously biased. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I the brain definitely controls all aspects of female reproduction, right? I mean, from um, uh, development through menstruation, fertility, pregnancy, uh, conception, childbirth, lactation, all of it, um, childcare rearing, the brain is, is, you know, ultimately the control center. Yep. Um, but it's, you know, there is this conversation going on. It's, it's not ruling like a dictator it's more like just constantly listening to feedback from 
from all sorts of places yeah. and integrating that feedback to sort of change things. And um, it's dynamic and it's not static. Um, and, you know, we, while we know, we, call, we talk about it like a conversation because, um, you know, there's a lot of words involved and what we know some of them. Um, so steroid hormones, for example, are a great example of, of, uh, of chemicals that signal between both the ovaries and the uterus and also the brain in both directions. Um, and some neuropeptides that have been characterized. So for example, um, gonadotropin releasing hormone or GnRH mm -hmm. is a really important player in the reproductive axis um, or kispeptin, that's another neuropeptide. Um, I should say too, that there are hundreds of neuropeptides. It's, there's not just one or two, there's a bunch of these things. Sure. Um, but we really don't know, you know the full lexicon of this conversation. And that's because uh, at the level, you know, when we dig into the science at the level of trying to monitor peptidergic signaling, um, mRNA, which is what we use as a proxy for a lot of things. So sure. looking at expression levels of genes, mRNA doesn't really have anything to do, like levels of mRNA in a cell pretty much don't usually correlate with the level of active peptide, right? Because remember these things are stored in vesicles and then they're released and they're not right. active until they're released. And so since they can be stored up, and they're released in response to different kinds of signals. The, um, the, you know, the mRNA levels, so looking at gene expression, doesn't really tell you anything about these systems. You actually need to go in and measure the peptides directly. And that is not trivial. Um, and that's something that my lab has been doing a lot of, which is to measure by mass spec levels of neuropeptides um, in different tissues and in, um, in plasma and CSF, um, and to ask how those, those things change with age. Um, but how the pieces of this kind of complex network fit into fertility and then the end of fertility or menopause is still a puzzle that I think, um, I think that's, I mean, from my perspective, I think that's going to be the thing that, um, that tells us how menopause works. Mm -hmm. But when you, you know, when you step back and you think about um, the part of the brain where the reproductive neural circuits reside in the hypothalamus, which is, you know, as I mentioned before, controlling all of these other aspects of homeostasis, then suddenly the sort of the constellation of physical and emotional um, symptoms or um, hallmarks associated with things like menstruation and motherhood and menopause, suddenly they're brought into sharp focus, right? Yep. Body temperature regulation. Oh, hot flashes. You know, there's a lot that makes sense there. Yep. And, um, you know, I'd say the research in this area has, you know, looking at central nervous system control of reproductive function has focused a lot on the HPG axis or the, uh, the hypothalamus pituitary gonadal axis. Um, and while it's clearly important, it's kind of ignored the, the diversity of neurons that are um, both in the hypothalamus, but also in other nodes in that circuit. And it's really completely ignored um, other neuropeptides and maybe even other steroid hormones. So this mm -hmm. is an area of active research in my lab. And um, thinking about menopause, which is really just, you know, it's defined by a woman running out of eggs in her ovary. Mm -hmm. So you know, ovaries are these strange organs. Um, they're very odd uh, in the body. They age precociously. So they age uh, much faster than the rest of the body. Um, and in that way, they're actually really exciting from an aging research perspective, because mm -hmm. we can use this kind of model of accelerated aging as a way to test interventions on a, on a much shorter time scale than a human lifespan, but sure. to do it in humans, right? Um, I know you just spoke with Dina recently and, and she brought this up. Um, yep. It's really exciting to think about doing uh, clinical trials for aging interventions um, on a three to five year time scale. Sure. Um, but ovaries, you know, they're, they're constantly in conversation with the brain. And when they, when they run out of eggs, they basically stop functioning. And that it's that cessation of, of, of communication that leads to all of the symptoms that we think about with menopause and all of those negative health uh, risks and all of the, the things that happen. And so um, I came into this because I wanted to understand what the causal, what's the causal cue that, that induces menopause so reliably, right? It happens, it's going to happen to every woman who makes it to midlife. There's no escaping it. Um, and it's, it's maybe one of the most reliable signatures in human health. <laughs> it's also the most, I would say, one of the most variable um, mm -hmm. in the sense that when you think about other 
things that happen to the human body over time, um, menopause is defined by this huge window of time, right? Like 14 years ish. So early menopause is before 40, late menopause is after 54. So there's this enormous window yep. during which quote unquote normal menopause happens. And that variability at the level of the individual trying to understand why it's so variable. That's another piece of piece of the puzzle. Anyway, we came into this um, kind of through oxytocin. And um, at, at, back in 2018, uh, Nicole Shanahan, who, um, who was interested in reproductive aging in females, um, she was really actually prescient in understanding that this was gonna be a, a super important piece of the puzzle with respect to longevity research. Um, and she approached us at the Buck Institute to start a center. She, um, she had struggled with her own fertility and um, had come to the conclusion that there was really a total lack of research happening in this area, which is true. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, which I can go into if you're interested, um, but sure. funding, yeah, I mean, mostly it's just about funding um, mm -hmm. and, and funding and, and maybe also the domination of the fields by uh, re sort of assisted reproductive technologies. Mm -hmm. So very little money for researchers to work in this space. Um, and then, you know, for people who were working in this space, a lot of the money was focused on basically just making IVF or egg freezing better. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and while, you know, I, while I think that it's amazing that we can do these things, I, I also think that um, they're sort of, it's, uh, it's rough <laughs> for a woman to go through and it's, it's not a zero sum game in terms of, you know, negative effects on the, on the mother's body. And mm -hmm. we really don't know what the effects with the long-term effects of, of giving all these hormones and hyper-stimulating and sure. doing all the things we do during uh, reproductive, assisted reproductive technologies. And so um, anyway, she asked us if we would be interested in, you know, setting up a center to study this, the Buck Institute. And when we looked at it carefully, we realized that, you know, if we can understand what's happening in ovaries during aging, that that truly will give us a window into what's happening in the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I was uh, tasked to be on the steering committee for this new center. And, um, and that's where it all started. Uh, at the end of uh, the first year, you know, I was talking to Nicole about, um, you know, how hard it was actually to locate, to, to identify and entice researchers to come and work in the space. Um, there definitely are people working in this area, but they're kind of spread out. Um, they're, they're few and far between, essentially. Lots of people working on reproductive biology. Yep. Lots of people now working on aging research. Very few um, at that interface looking at reproductive aging. Mm -hmm. Not not from a fertility standpoint, but right. from a basic science standpoint. And um, you know, she's she was kind of shocked. And uh, and when I explained to her that there's not a lot of funding in this space, um, that's when we we came up with this idea for the consortium. So the Global Consortium is also housed at the Buck Institute, and um, it's meant to complement what we're doing in the center, because we can only accomplish so much right. um, with the scientists in the center. And we're doing, you know, I think we're doing amazing work, but um, we wanted to have a bigger impact and recognizing that there's this huge need to build out the field, basically to build the ecosystem around studying these questions. And so, um, the consortium is meant to provide resources to scientists. So we do that through grant funding. Um, we gave away our first grants last August to mm -hmm. 23 different researchers all over the world. And we will continue giving away grants, um, hopefully every year. We took a break because of COVID. Um, but the goal is to really like strengthen and broaden the reach of what we're doing. And related to resources, we also provide our grantees with access to our bioinformatics and AI core here at the Buck mm -hmm. Institute to analyze large data sets. Um, we opened the world's first uh, ovarian biology core facility. We call it the Reproductive Biology Hub. Okay. Um, so kind of like a, a microscopy facility or a sequencing facility at, an, at a university, the Reproductive Biology Hub is set up to do experiments on ovaries. So um, for a researcher, for a scientist who's coming from outside the field, because essentially what we want to do is we want to engage an army of creative scientists, right? We want to get the best and the brightest to work on this problem. And as a scientist, if I'm moving into a new field, there's a, you know, there's a pretty big 
um, activation energy there for me to just learn something new and to get the people in my lab to learn something new. And so the hub is there um, to provide both fee for service experiments for people who don't have the expertise to work on ovarian biology, mm -hmm. but also we staffed it with these amazing, amazing reproductive biologists who can act as collaborators. So more than just doing fee for service experiments, they can actually help guide, you know, the, the direction of the research, think about next steps. Um, and in non-COVID times, when we can be in person, um, we will have, uh, we'll have uh, opportunities for people to send their trainees, so their students and their postdocs, to learn those techniques and bring them back to their home labs. Mm. Um, and then we've also set up a translational advisory board, um, both for the grantees and also for the, the scientists in the center, um, as a way to you know, to move things forward faster. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, academic scientists are not always really skilled at identifying things that are translatable. And even when they do, you know, for the most part, something that's going to divert a scientist's attention away from doing science mm -hmm. is not something they're usually very interested in doing. Mm -hmm. And so um, the Translational Advisory Board is helping us identify early on things that might be um, translatable. And then we can immediately pair that PI, that primary investigator with someone, a program manager, or someone who can take over the sort of the translation aspect and leave them to do their basic science. Um, but truly the goal is, you know, we are envisioning the consortium as kind of an innovation hub and mm -hmm. um, building this field out in a way that's both sustainable, but also impactful. Um, and just the, the goal truly is to figure out, you know, what is causing this decline in fertility in women um, mm -hmm. that leads to menopause and, and to try to develop interventions to slow it down or stop it um, and, and to make products and diagnostics and biomarkers and therapeutics available to women faster. That's, that's really what we're trying to do. And, and, and within the, um, the Center for Reproductive Longevity and Equality, is there, as in the uh, sort of the, the, the other, the, the main part is sort of the longevity biotech community where people like to throw things out, like 90 will become the new 50. Is, <laughs> is there a, 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 um, a, a new menopause age that you guys envision <laughs> at the center? I mean, honestly, gosh, I mean, in the short term, I hope that we can push menopause out by at least five years soon. Okay. Um, I, I think, you know, there's not been a lot of work in this space, but there's a lot of exciting targets that are coming up. Um, and there's a lot of exciting research that's been going on. Um, and so I think that's not outside the realm of possibilities. I, our, our moonshot goal is to just get rid of menopause. Um, there's no reason we need it. Uh, it's not a biological imperative. Um, but in terms of, you know, I, it's a little bit of a lofty goal, but in terms of thinking practically about a woman's health and also equality, right? This is truly an equality issue. Um, the fact that women go through this reproductive decline in midlife is something that really impacts every aspect of a woman's well being. Um, so, you know, we think about it that way too, but the, the graph that everyone knows, the sort of the number of eggs over time is, is characterized by this single point of inflection and then a cliff, um, that, that the number of eggs and the quality of the eggs falls off of around midlife. And we're trying to, you know, to figure out why that happens but mm -hmm. at the same time if we can if we can find ways to just extend if we can find ways to just extend the age of menopause so taking um the number of eggs that a woman has when she's 40 um and even just doubling that number which wouldn't be very you know very many extra eggs um that would you know that would change imagine what that would do for a, a woman's sure. life in terms of her career in terms of her overall health um, it would be amazing. And so, you know, we have small short-term goals, but really lofty long-term goals. <laughs> uh, my, my, and my wife would be very happy with me getting rid of it entirely <laughs> components. So, yeah. <laughs> well, we want to make it optional, right? So, you know, you don't have to opt out of it, but, exactly. <laughs> but if exactly. you wanted to, you could. I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm on that front. <laughs> so Jennifer, we've, uh, so far we've gone, um, uh, from neuropeptides, the neuropeptides in aging. We talked about oxytocin. Uh, we talked about the amazing work you're doing uh, in, in female reproductive aging, the Center for Reproductive Longevity and Equality. 
Now we're going to throw all that out. <laughs> it's great stuff. We're going to put great. it over here for now. And we're okay. going to come back uh, to 2017 uh, to a paper in science that you published entitled Linking Smell to Metabolism and Aging, uh, where you discuss the olfactory system, its effects on energy homeostasis, and specifically highlight interesting phytochemicals from Szechuan peppercorns that may be involved in, in uh, different aspects of potassium channel signaling and so forth. Um, I, I'm a, I have a, a personal passion for natural products and natural product, you know, phytochemistry and so forth. Um, but at the same time, just the other day, um, I had uh, Dr. Uh, John Joe McFadden on the show from uh, Surrey in the UK, and he's you know very big on sort of the quantum biology front, uh, and he talks about olfaction too, and it's one of those things. Oh uh, yeah, smell, you know, okay, we smell stuff, and it goes to our brain, but whatever. Um, but he's pointed out, no, olfaction is extremely complex, and whether I smell a Szechuan peppercorn or chocolate or whatever, there's millions of different pathways that send those smells and signals and affect the neuropeptides peptides and everything else. And he talks about the quantum stuff, which goes over my head. But um, coming back to you, talk a little bit about uh, olfaction and potential connection to uh, various biologic endpoints in the human body. I find this area fascinating. Okay. Yeah. Take about a half not, hour. <laughs> no problem. Um, not my area of expertise, but I could talk about it for a while. Um, that, that 2017, it was a perspective piece that I wrote for science um, because there were several papers that were published around that time um, that, that had pointed towards a role for uh, olfaction in, in aging. And um, I think you're right. It's very complicated, right? Uh, Olfaction is um, again like a multi, it's a combinatorial system. Right. And the combination of receptors that get activated by the combination of, of chemicals that make up a, a constellation of smell, right? Smell is usually you're, when you're sensing an odor, it's usually not just one component. There's usually many chemicals that make up an odor, and it's yeah. that again like a symphony. Um, <laughs> so it has a lot of parallels to neuropeptide signaling. And you're right that those um, primary sensory neurons that, that are olfactory um, do themselves release neuropeptides, but then they hook into circuits that, um, that also release neuropeptides. And when I say circuit, just so that, because I know not everyone that's listening to this is, is a scientist. When I say circuit, what I mean is that the brain, um, you know, the cells in the brain don't act in isolation. They're all yep. both connected up to each other, kind of like wires in an electrical circuit. Yep. Um, and that's, you know, the synaptic signaling that we were talking about. But then they do this wireless signaling, kind of like Wi-Fi. And that Wi-Fi signaling is the kind of peptidergic and chemical signaling mm -hmm. that I was just talking about. So there's two modes of communication there. Anyway, side sidetrack. Um, in terms of smell, we know from uh, from worms, actually, actually from my postdoctoral advisor's postdoctoral work, that um, that smell can influence a whole host of different physiologic functions. Um, and it certainly is important for aging. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, understanding how and why um, olfactory receptor expression changes and declines with age, um, why olfactory neurons uh, tend not to be um, renewed with aging, all of those things are active areas of research outside of my, um, my sphere, but that kind of work is going on. Um, but it's really clear that all sorts of sensory input, um, temperature sensing, smell, <laughs> um, all, all sorts of sensory input is important for aging and that, that feedback that's going on, right? Um, yep. the, the feedback that's going on is, is probably really important for setting these homeostatic circuits at, their, at the homeostat, at the level that they're supposed to be at. Mm. And when that changes or when it gets pushed outside of a range where it can be brought back to where it should be, um, I think that's, those are the sorts of things that, that tip things towards aging. That, that, mm. That's my personal view of, of this sort of thing. Now, Sichuan peppercorns, um, you know, when I was a graduate student, uh, I also love natural products, obviously. Um, I think they're really cool. So, you know, a natural product is just something that's a chemical that's made by an organism or a plant mm -hmm. um, in nature. And they tend to be really, really specific and really, really complicated. Yep. Um, because they've had a lot of time to evolve. Uh, and so Szechuan peppercorns, um, when, I, when I started as a PhD student, 
one of my rotations. So, you know, as a first year PhD student, you go and do short projects in several different labs mm-hmm. um, before you pick one to do your, your thesis in. So I was rotating through David Julius's lab at um, UCSF. And David has a long history of investigating really cool, really cool natural um, chemistry and biology and the interaction between um, these uh, sensory molecules and and the brain. So he cloned the uh, capsaicin receptor. So he figured out how the active ingredient in chili peppers works. Yep. Um, and so when I started rotating, he said, hey, you know, such wild peppercorns have this kind of different feel. You know, they have a different um, a different response than like a hot chili pepper, right? And so I think there's probably some other chemical in there that's doing something different, right? When you when you eat Sichuan peppercorns or you eat Sichuan food, it kind of feels like um, like you're putting your tongue on a battery, right? It's a mm-hmm. different sensation than that burning you get when you eat a hot chili pepper. And so he said, why don't you, since you've got this interest in chemistry, why don't you try to isolate the active ingredient and then um, we'll do what they do in the Julius lab, which was um, use expression cloning to figure out um, first what neurons it's activating and then what receptors in those neurons or what channels in those neurons is it activating. So what's the molecular mechanism of how it's working? Um, And so that was super fun because uh, Sichuan peppercorns uh, smelled beautiful. And so, you know, I did it. I I would go to the, like the Chinese market and grind up Sichuan peppercorns and <laughs> do a bunch of like extractions and, you know, like old school organic chemistry yeah. um, to isolate the active ingredient, which is called alpha hydroxy central. And this was a super complicated experiment because um, alpha hydroxy central has this long chain of unsaturated, it doesn't matter, but um, basically the there's a double bond that can isomerize with light. And so what that means is that light can inactivate this molecule. And so I did all of my work at night and I had foil <laughs> covering all of the chemical hoods and red lights and, um, and the, the lab would smell so beautiful <laughs> after I did one of these extractions because the, the, the active ingredients in Sichuan peppercorns are just really fragrant and floral mm-hmm. and, and lovely. Um, and so I did that uh, for a few months in the Julius lab and I um, spent some time, you know, looking at calcium imaging and dorsal root ganglia neurons to figure out which neurons were being activated. And then I went on to my next rotation and I decided to join a different lab. Um, sorry, David. <laughs> and, uh, and a few months later, he hired a postdoctoral fellow to come in, um, Diana Bautista, who's still a wonderful friend and collaborator. And uh, she came in and took this project on as her postdoctoral project. And so um, when she took it up, she was a neuroscientist, not a chemist. And so uh, we collaborated uh, going forward on this project and I would continue to isolate the active ingredient for her. And she did a lot of the the physiology to figure out which potassium channels were activated. And so that resulted in a really beautiful paper um, in, I don't even remember what year, 2008, (laughs) a long time ago. Um, But that was such a wonderful, and that was a really beautiful example of how you can use chemistry to study biology. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, when, when I have enough money at some point, I want I'll, I will start a uh, a center for olfaction, uh, natural products, and longevity, and, and maybe and equality too. Because I don't know if there's any difference the way olfaction happens between men and women, but um, oh, very different. Yeah, yeah. very different. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it, it, it's just a, I, I wanted to bring it up. I was joking with you before, but it just shows the really the the breadth and, uh, of, of everything you've been involved in, and um, obviously you have, a, you have a lot on your plate. Uh, but uh, really, really fascinating set of work, and and really you know wishing you the best with all of this uh, going forward because it's such a, an important area, as you were mentioning with regard to the clinical interesting sort of the, the elegance in the clinical design based on some of the menopause stuff that we're not going to be waiting 20 years for for a clinical trial on that front but uh, a lot of really really interesting thought you put into this and it's just very very impressive work um for everybody uh that's going to be listening to this particular episode uh on our podcast or uh watching on the youtube channel uh you've been listening to dr jennifer garrison uh, assistant professor buck institute for research on aging founder faculty director global consortium for reproductive longevity and equality assistant professor in residence cellular molecular pharmacology ecsf and adjunct assistant professor of gerontology usc leonard davis school of gerontology uh jennifer it was 
was really great having you uh, and, and then listening to your story. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to do with this. Uh, thanks for everything you're up to. And as we like to say on our show, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow through, through all your work. Really very inspiring things. Thank you, Ira. I really appreciate the opportunity to tell you all that. Um, that was super fun. <laughs> we'll do it again soon. Okay.